We're going to finish up the discussion, the proof of LP decoding from last lecture, and then uh, we're not going to do any hard technical stuff, but I'll give you sort of the high-level goals of smooth analysis. That's what we'll do uh, in the second half of the lecture. So let me help you page back in uh, where we left off last time. The good news is almost everything we did Monday we can just sort of accept as true and then sort of just uh, proceed from there, which is what were we doing? Uh, so we were considering decoding. So we talked about these families of codes, which you can define using a graph, a bipartite graph. So on the left-hand side, you have variables. On the right-hand side, you have these parity checks. So each parity check just consists of a subset of the variables and is asking that an even number of those, that subset of variables is equal to 1. And the, co and the code words are exactly those uh, vectors that satisfy every single one of those parity checks. And so we proved last time on Monday, information theoretically, that these codes have good distance if you use a, a, a bipartite graph that has expansion. So that was this short proof we did that used the fact that uh, many parity checks have a unique uh, neighbor if you have a bunch of corruptions. And then we shifted attention to focusing, okay, how can we do it computationally efficiently? We don't just want to know that it's possible in principle to decode. We want a polynomial time algorithm to do it. And like several previous lectures, we're studying in particular when does linear programming work. What does it mean by work? Well, we write down the linear relaxation for this NP-hard problem. Okay, so we started with an integer program, which was exactly the problem of finding the nearest code word to a given uh, message Z. We looked at linear relaxation. Sometimes it's going to be fractional because the problem's NP-hard, but we're asking for sufficient conditions under which we solve the linear program in polynomial time, and it gives us back on a silver platter the nearest code word. Okay, so extra conditions under which we get the exact solution. And we made a lot of progress on Monday so specifically, we identified a sufficient condition under which the unique optimal solution to this linear program is indeed what we want, is indeed the nearest code word uh, to the corrupted code word that we were given. So let me just remind you sort of what, what, those, uh, what that condition was. So the condition, okay, so here's the theorem we're trying to prove. Uh, so all of this is exactly the same terminology and notation as Monday. So this is all in your notes or on the video from last time. So we're thinking about a bipartite graph that satisfies three conditions. The first two conditions basically just says it's bounded degree. Okay, so that's the low density part of the low density parity check. In particular, every node on the left-hand side has degree D. Okay, and think of D as maybe like 12. So that's the number of parity checks in which each variable participates. The right-hand side, i.e. the number of variables in a parity check, that's also constant, maybe twice as big, okay, 25, something like that. The third condition is the expansion condition. So I've written that here so that you can remember. So this is what says that on the left-hand side, if on the left-hand side of the bipartite graph, you take a constant, uh, constant fraction of the vertices, S, okay, so at most delta times N, where delta is some constant, then the number of distinct neighbors of S, and of course it's bipartite, so the neighbors are on the right-hand side, the number of distinct neighbors of nodes of S is almost as big as it could possibly be. Every node on the left-hand side has degree D, so the most number of labels you, uh, neighbors you could possibly have is D times capital S. You have 75% of that at least, and that's true for every sufficiently small set S, all the way up to a constant fraction of the nodes, all the way up to delta N nodes. So that's condition three, okay? So we're trying to prove that any, whenever you have a, a code defined by such a bipartite graph, then this linear program, and, 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 and you uh, suffered sufficiently few errors. So last time I wrote delta naught times n. I'm just taking delta naught to be delta over 2. So if you suffered at most delta n over 2 errors, then the LP is exact. And we proved that if there exists feasible edge weights for the bipartite graph, and I'll tell you what that means, uh, but we proved if there exists feasible edge weights, then we get the conclusion we want. Then we get exactness of the LP. So we reduced the proof of the theorem to the proof under the same hypotheses of the existence of a certain family of edge weights. Okay? So that's what we accomplished on Monday. So the remaining action item, the remaining thing to do is to show that under these hypotheses we really can exhibit weights that satisfy these conditions. Okay? And so that's, gonna, that's what we're going to do for the next 20 or 30 minutes or so. Right, so the proof of that, that's what we did at the end of last lecture, that was just this weak duality argument, which is sort of kind of very algebraic, but you just follow your nose and it works out. In some sense, really you should think of it, you know, the reason these things are defined the way they're defined is exactly so that proof at the end of last lecture works. I mean, really, the way you think about it is you start with the proof that you want and then you reverse engineer the condition, and this is just the condition that pops out. Okay, it's a special case of weak duality. All right, so what, what is a feasible edge weight? This is what we actually got to have to exhibit this lecture. So we have this graph, so we're going to assign a weight to every single edge of the graph, that's Wij, could be positive or negative. 
And the first two conditions basically say, you know, it gives us a budget on the total edge weight that can be incident to a node on the left-hand side. Okay. So if we think about some node on the left-hand side and its various neighbors, all right, so one other thing to remember, also on the homework, and we mentioned this Monday, by a shifting argument to prove the theorem, we can focus on the case where the code word we want to recover is all zeros, okay, which is definitely a member of the code. So we're, in our mind, we think of that the sender sent the code word zero. There are most this many errors, so we get a vector with at most this many ones, everything else is zero, and we want to, and we want to solve this LP and have it solved to the all zeros uh, solution. Okay. So capital I denotes the coordinates with no corruption, so these denote the zeros. J denotes the ones, so there aren't that many of these. This is where we got a bit flip, okay? Feasible edge weights, that means that uh, for all of the uncorrupted coordinates, you get a budget of one on the sum of these edge weights. But for the corrupted coordinates, these have to on average be negative, okay? So the sum of these edge weights has to be less than minus one. So those are the first two conditions. Then we also have this condition on pairs, which is, on the other hand, if you think about it from the right-hand side of the graph, so you look at any two variables that participate in a parity check J, then the sum of their edge weights should be non-negative. Okay? So we actually needed this for all even cardinality sets, but then we observed at the end of last lecture, if you have this for pairs, you have it for all e even cardinality sets just automatically. Okay? So that's where we were. So we want to prove that under these conditions, these always exist. And the proof is I'm just going to show you the weights. Okay? So any questions about what we're doing or why? That's the missing lemma. All right. Then let's do it. So proof. All right, so J is the errors, remember? And there aren't too many of them. And that's obviously going to have to be used somewhere. Uh, so here's the first step. Um, so we're going to exhibit these weights. And we're obviously, we're gonna, have that, we're gonna have to make sure that both A and B hold. And somehow, you know, right on the borderline, uh, we're gonna have to have still a third argument. So the first step is we're almost gonna take a closure operation over the corrupted coordinates. So we're gonna supplement the corrupted coordinates J by extra coordinates which weren't themselves corrupted, but, you know, somehow, you know, they're, they're almost like uh, corrupted by osmosis by other corruptions that they share a lot of parity checks with, okay? So, Precisely, I'm going to define a set K of coordinates. So again, uh, coordinates, of, i.e., a bunch of very, uh, vertices on the left-hand side. So these are coordinates which are not themselves corrupted, okay, so they belong to I, but at least 50% of their parity checks do have a corrupted variable. Okay. So in other words, have neighbors in J, all right? So the picture you want to have in mind is, so here are all the flipped coordinates, J, and they have some neighbors. And you always want to think of sort of the parity checks that these variables appear in are polluted in some sense, right? So they've got some things going wrong. And K, so vertex in K is somebody for whom a lot of their parity checks contain some other corrupted variable. Okay. All right, so that's the definition. And uh, you'll sort of see why we use this definition in a second. But the first thing I want to prove is that actually, you know, even if we throw in K, it doesn't blow up the sort of size of coordinates we have to argue about by very much. Okay, so K is sort of not much bigger than J. So the claim is that if we look at J and K together, so the corrupted coordinates plus these kind of corrupted by uh, relationship coordinates, it's still at most delta N. Delta is the same delta as in the expansion uh, condition, okay? So that's the first thing I want to prove. So this will be the first, but not the last time that we use the expansion condition. <coughs> so proof of claim. It's 
So suppose not. Uh, we're going to proceed by contradiction, and the contradiction will be eventually to the expansion condition that G allegedly satisfies. So suppose, in fact, this is bigger than delta N. I want to choose a subset that's exactly size delta N. Okay, the reason I want it that size is because I want the expansion condition to actually apply to this subset. And this only goes up to si sets of size delta N. Okay? So choose a bunch of coordinates. Okay, so again, we're dealing with left-hand side vertices here. So that, on the one hand, basically what we do is we take the corrupted coordinates, J, and we just supplement them by these, you know, corrupted by, you know, one hop coordinates up until the size of delta N, okay? So J union K, and the size of S is exactly delta times N, okay? So in this picture over here, I'm taking all of J and part of K. All right, so I want to show that this condition is violated, and that's my contradiction. So what does this condition say? It talks about the neighbors of S. Okay, so basically I'm going to want to say that actually if J union K is too big, then here's a set that doesn't expand. All right? So to talk about it not expanding, I need to count its neighbors. I need to say the number of distinct neighbors is not too big. So let's try to figure out how many neighbors does S have, okay? And intuitively, right, if you look about the definition of K, K is defined as basically saying it already has a lot of redundant neighbors with the people already in J, right? So that's sort of where the contradiction is going to come from, right? There's just too many neighbors in common, all right, given that this thing is an expander. But, you know, to really prove that, we need a short calculation. So um, to count the neighbors of S, Let's first count the neighbors of just the corrupted coordinates. And then let's count the extra neighbors, distinct neighbors, that the vertices that we picked from K, so the vertices in K intersect S, contribute to the set. Okay? So this is going to be uh, the neighbors of, let's see, S intersect K. So this is just the vertices of S that we haven't already counted in J, but again, we, don't, we just want to count distinct neighbors, so we're going to subtract back out the ones we already counted that the neighbors of J. Okay? Alright, so again, we're just breaking up the neighbors of S by those who uh, are a neighbor of somebody in J and those who aren't a neighbor of somebody in J. All right. So now, again, we want to say this is not too big, so we want an upper bound. So to upper bound this first thing, we're just going to use it as deregular on the left-hand side, okay? So this contributes at most d times the number of corrupted coordinates. And of course, this we have control over. This is the number of errors, and we're assuming there's not too many, okay? So that's fine. We have an upper bound on that. And then the second step, we're just going to have an upper bound by the definition of k, okay? The fact that k already has a lot of their neighbors already covered by j, okay? So in particular, you know, for each vertex, each coordinate of k, you know, at least half of its uh, Neighbors are redundant with those we've already counted, so they're each contributing at most d over 2 to the number of neighbors, okay? given that we've already counted j. So plus d over 2 times the cardinality of s intersects k. Okay? So any questions about that step? All right, so again, this per vertex is trivial. This, the per vertex contributions by the definition of k. All right. So we know J can't be too big, right? We're assuming that there's at most delta N over two errors, right? The set overall has size delta N, so whatever is remaining is in here. So this is at least delta N over two. And for the purposes of an upper bound, right, since these are contributing less than this, the worst case for our upper bound is that basically this and this have the same, exactly the same size, delta n over 2. Okay? That's as big as this could get, as if this is as large as possible and this is as small as possible. So what if it were actually the case that uh, this was delta n over 2 and this was delta n over 2? Uh, then it would just give us uh, d delta n. Well, so basically you do this computation, the dust settles, and you get that this is at most um, three quarters d delta n, okay? 
delta n over 2, delta n over 2, you add these, you get 3d over 2. So 2 times 2 of the denominator gives you the 4. Okay. And now we're done because delta n is just equal to the size of s. So we've just counted up the neighbors and proved that it's strictly less than 75% of d times the size of s. And that's the reason I left this expansion condition up here. So you can see that's an immediate contradiction. Okay, that's exactly what this asserts can't happen. Okay. How do you compute the imports? Is that the minimum possible value? It is not. I'm sort of toying with the idea of putting on the homework, asking you what is the minimum value for which everything in these proofs work. So it's a, it's a value which is not too far from the minimum possible for which the proof works, and subject to that, keeps the numbers nice throughout lecture. Yeah. I'm looking out for you guys. <laughs> All right, so that's, uh, so that's sort of a, a preliminary step that we need. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, when we want to verify the feasibility condition, it's convenient to not just have a dichotomy between corrupted and uncorrupted coordinates, but in fact have a trichotomy, which includes this third case, about coordinates which are sort of not themselves corrupted, but share lots of stuff with these, uh, share lots of parity checks with corrupted variables. Okay? But it's not a big deal, because this isn't too big. Okay. So, good. So now I can just tell you the weights. Um, the set K actually has an intuitive, an intuitive meaning too, because if you were doing a local search method to try to reconstruct the the code word, right? Mm -hmm. like these these are the variables where they would say, hey, I should be flipped, right? Because half of my half of my parity checks say I should be flipped. Potentially, I mean, it sort of depends on exactly how many. It depends on the parity of the number of flipped variables that you share the parity check with. Right, so that would be true yes. if you were sort of the only one who was flipped, if, you know, or if an even number of other people were flipped. But absolutely, somehow, you'd think that if you sh lots of your parity checks are shared with corrupted variables, you'd sort of expect most of your parity checks to be messed up intuitively. Really proving that is not obvious, but uh, that's definitely good intuition. Okay? At least you're at risk in some sense. Yeah. You'd sort of expect it to... Right, so certainly if most of your parity checks, certainly the converse, if most of your parity checks do not have corrupted variables, then you're going to look locally quite good, for sure. And it's good intuition to think about the converse as just holding, even though that direction requires a proof and uses the expansion condition. Okay, so let me just define for you the weights. Okay. And this is pretty slick. So this is actually not the first proof. This was sort of a slightly simpler version of the original proof by Feldman et al. that came along a few years later. Uh, and yeah, it's slick, so let's just go through it. All right, so we're going to define the, so, uh, so here's the plan, right? So these are the three conditions we need. And um, the one which looks, to me, intuitively, I kind of have the, less, the least feel for is the third one. So what we're going to do is we're going to define the weights so the third condition just obviously holds. Okay, that won't be the problem. And then we'll have to check that A and B hold, okay? So we'll define, so this third constraint is, is you know, talking about the right-hand side. So because, it, so, you know, correspondingly, we'll define the weights J by J independently. Okay, so in some sense, each parity check J will specify what the weights are for all of, the, uh, for all of its edges, you know, so with the variables that it includes. So here's how it works. So each parity check picks a favorite, okay. favorite variable. So I'm going to use the notation V of J for the variable chosen by J. It's got to be one of the variables in it. And uh, there's going to be a non-trivial constraint, which is that if you're a corrupted coordinate or if you're you know, one of these friends of corrupted coordinates in K, you have to be chosen by lots and lots of parity checks. Okay? That's going to be a requirement. So chosen at least three quarters d times. Okay. Now, of course, you can only be chosen by parity checks in which you participate, and you only participate in d parity checks. Okay, so there's no way you're chosen by more than d people. And the insistence is that at least, and is at least for these coordinates in j and k, you better be chosen close to the maximum number of times. Okay, 75% of your parity checks better choose you. Now, if you think about it, it's not obvious you can do that, okay? Because a given parity check has lots of variables. And actually, maybe even a given parity check has lots of corrupted variables. 
I can only pick one of them. Okay? And that could totally happen. So remember, we might have 1% you know, of the things being errors. Right? And a parity check has a constant number of variables, you know, like 20. Right? So maybe there's a million coordinates, 10,000 are corrupt, and a given parity check has 20 variables. For all we know, all 20 are corrupted. Okay? So it has to pick only one, and those other 19 will not be chosen by this parity check. So the hope, of course, is then that, well, you know, then hopefully there's, you know, most of those variables, other parity checks can choose them. Okay? Now that wouldn't work if somehow those 19 variables showed up in all of these other parity checks together. But now intuitively, if it's got this expander condition and everything's kind of totally scrambled all over the place, maybe that doesn't happen. Okay? That'd be the hope. Okay? And it's true. And actually, it's not that hard to prove, it turns out. Uh, especially if you know Hall's theorem. So who knows Hall's theorem? Raise your hand. You should know Hall's theorem. Okay. So Hall's theorem, who knows max flow min cut? Okay. So Hall's theorem is a corollary of max flow min cut. Okay. Actually, a quite easy corollary. It would be a great, like, 261 problem set question to just deduce Hall's theorem from max flow min cut. But here's what it's, but, you know, Hall's theorem came first, actually. It was from the 30s, I think. So it's about uh, matchings. So let's just say, let's just think it's talk about perfect matchings for a second. So suppose you had a bipartite graph, and you're wondering whether or not it has a perfect matching. Okay? So to convince you that it does have a perfect matching, okay, really easy. I'll show you the matching. Okay? So if you like, matching is in NP. All right? Uh, so, but it's actually quite easy to put in co-NP using Hall's theorem. I mean, we know it's in polynomial time, but forget about that for a second. So certainly one, you know, way I could convince you that there isn't a perfect matching is if I showed you a constricting set. So suppose I showed you 10 variables on the left-hand side, so that the number of distinct neighbors of these 10 nodes was a set of only 8 nodes. You should then be convinced that there will not be a perfect matching of this graph. In a perfect matching, any set of k variables has, you know, k mates, they're distinct. So if you don't have 10 distinct neighbors of this set of 10 variables, no way can you have a perfect matching. Okay? So it's clear that a necessary condition for a perfect matching is that every single subset of k vertices on the left-hand side has at least k distinct neighbors on the right-hand side. If you don't have that property, you certainly don't have a perfect matching. Hall's theorem asserts the converse. If it is the case that every single subset of k vertices on the left-hand side has at least k distinct neighbors, then there does in fact exist a perfect matching. Okay? And so this again, you can deduce it just from max flow min cut. All right? So the flows give you the matchings and the min cuts. If you don't have a perfect matching, then the, max, then the min cut of the graph will basically exhibit for you one of these constricted sets. Okay? So this I'll put on the homework. I'll, I'll just let you take Hall's theorem as a black box. Okay, although, again, it's, you basically already know how to prove it. But using Hall's theorem, it is then quite straightforward to show that because the graph is an expander, which, of course, talks exactly about the number of distinct neighbors that any subset of the left-hand side has, because the graph is an expander and the number of distinct neighbors is at least 0.75 d times the size of the set, you can find sort of a union of 0.75 times d matchings. Okay? Which is the same thing as basically saying each node on the left-hand side is chosen three quarters times d times. Okay, so it's not obvious, but if you think about Hall's theorem a little bit and you use the fact it's expander, it's just true. All right. So any questions about that? For the rest of the proof, I'm just going to assume that we have such a matching. Okay, but again, here, here again we are using the expansion property of the graph. All right. Questions? All right, so every parity check picks a favorite variable, and uh, the constraint is that any corrupted variable or friend of corrupted variables, anybody in J and K has picked lots of times. Okay, so maybe think of D as like 12, everybody gets picked nine times. Okay, everybody in J or K. All right, so what are the weights? All right, so homework, this is possible. All right, so here's how we define the weights. We define them differently depending on if the chosen variable is corrupted or not. Okay? So if the chosen variable is corrupted, which sort of makes sense if you think about it, right? Because, I mean, 
C is going to be, we're just going to define these so that C holds, but we also are eventually going to have to worry about A and B. And it's really, the, the corrupted variables impose a pretty nasty restriction on these weights. So we basically have, have to have like lots of negative weights next to a corrupted coordinate, but at the same time we have to have these non-negative pairs. Okay, so that's why we're going to treat them differently. So for a chosen variable that is corrupted, we're going to uh, have the corresponding edge have a negative value. So we set the weight of the edge between the favorite variable and this parity check to be equal to minus 2 over d minus epsilon, where epsilon is, don't worry about epsilon, that's just like a tie-breaking epsilon. Okay, so epsilon is an arbitrarily small constant, minus 2 over the degree d of the left-hand side nodes. Okay, so the, the 2 is probably a little mysterious right now. Um, the two is some slack that we need. The reciprocal in D, we actually mentioned this very briefly uh, last time when I tried to develop your intuition about the weights. So let me go through that discussion again. So intuitively, because um, existence of the weights implies exactness of this linear program, we're sort of thinking that, you know, ex you know we're thinking that the ex exhibiting feasible weights should get harder and harder as there are more and more errors, okay, as J is bigger and bigger. And remember, if J was empty, Okay, so if you literally had no errors at all, then this is a trivial problem because you just set all the w's to be equal to zero. Okay? But then we, and then we also argue that, well, and at least it's a you know, vaguely robust argument, and is that if j is still super small, if j is so small that no parity check has more than one corrupted variable, then it's also really easy to exhibit uh, feasible weights. Basically just for each, uh, basically what you do, is just next to each corrupted variable, you just give all the edges the weight like minus one over D. Okay, so it has to have a total of minus one, you just spread it equally among the D adjacent edges, so that's minus one over D next to corrupted variables. And then to make sure you have this pairs condition, next to uncorrupted variables, you just have a one over D on all of the D edges. And as long as no single parity check has two corrupted variables, then this condition is going to be satisfied. Okay? Of course, that's not good enough for what we're trying to prove. Right? Because again, we might have a parity check which is entirely corrupted variables. Right? So we're doing some more clever version of the argument, but we actually have seen this 1 over d before. Okay? That's basically saying we're trying to get you know, a negative contra we're, we're not trying to get the minus 1 from just one edge. That would be crazy. Right? We're trying to get this minus 1 contribution to the edges incident to a corrupted variable like roughly equally from the incident edges. Okay? So we can't have it exactly equally, but we can have it up to a factor 2 roughly equally from the incident vertices. All right? So that's why you shouldn't be too shocked to see this reciprocal in D show up. Okay, now, but if we want C to be satisfied, it's actually pretty obvious what the rest of the edges incident to J better have their weights defined as. So remember condition C says that any pair of edges with the same right hand side vertex have to have some of weights non-negative. I just slapped down a negative weight so that lower bounds the weight of everything else incident to j to the negative of that, okay? To 2 over d, d minus epsilon, okay? So set the other wij's equal to 2 over d minus epsilon, okay? Clear? Okay, so there remains what to do for parity checks whose favorite vertex is not corrupted. So if the chosen vertex does not belong to J, then we just set WI J to be equal to zero for all incident edges. I want you to observe, so a subtle point is these friends of corrupted vertices, vertices in K, also are in that second case, okay? So if I'm a parity check J, and I choose a variable which is not corrupted, even if it's a friend of corrupted variables, I still have everything be zero, okay? So that's sort of important. So again, these vertices in K are kind of walking a fine line between being treated as corrupted sometimes and uncorrupted as others, okay? So those are the weights. Is that clear? Is the definition clear? Is it also obvious that condition C holds? 
the third condition of the feasible weights. Yeah. Why, why can't you have all corrupted bits going to like one parity check or like 20 corrupted bits going to one parity check? You absolutely can. What? You absolutely can. Oh, okay. Yeah. And why is condition C satisfied? Condition C is satisfied because we force each parity check to pick a single favorite variable. And the negative weight only gets to go between the parity check and its favorite variable. So if you have a parity check with 20 variables, all of which are corrupted, one of those corrupted variables for this parity check will pick up a negative. The rest will actually pick up a positive, which is kind of crazy because those corrupted variables have to have a, they only have a budget of minus one. So we're actually sort of walk, you know, we're making backward progress as far as getting it down to minus one. But as far as the but that's sort of a, you know, that's kind of punting the problem down a little bit, right? So eventually we have to verify B, and you should definitely be wondering why why does B hold? Um, even A, like the factor of two can even make you nervous about property A actually. Uh, but C, which was the one that maybe seemed the hardest to control, that's the one we just kind of said, well, let's make sure we do C and then suffer the consequences later. Okay. Everyone ready to verify A and B? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Three cases. So let's start with the corrupted case, which is sort of the one you know, we're kind of worried about a little bit because the budget is so stringent, minus one. All right, so in this case, so this is what we need to compute. So now we're, okay, so we define the weights from the right-hand side of the graph, but now to verify A and B, we have to think about things from the left-hand side of the graph. Okay, so we fixed I, and we're thinking about all of its outgoing edges. So we have a budget of minus one here. So a question for you, so notice that the weights take on only three distinct values. Okay, zero, positive, or negative. And there's only one positive value, there's only one negative value. How many of those three values are candidates for a WIJ when J is a corrupted coordinate? So if I don't tell you anything else other than IJ is a node in the graph and I was corrupted. The negative one and the positive one. Anything else? Could it be zero? No, it's only for if it's not element of J. Why could it not be zero? Oh, that's VJ. So remember, just because you're corrupted doesn't mean that every parity tech chose you. Okay, it means that like nine out of 12 chose you, but there's also three that maybe didn't choose you. And if you weren't chosen, maybe someone who wasn't corrupted was chosen instead. In which case, you're gonna be zero, actually. So this could be any of the three values, okay? Now, what we do have going for us is that, by virtue of being a corrupted coordinate, in a parity check J for which I is the favorite chosen variable, V of J, then, by definition, that edge weight is negative. Okay? So that's the first thing we have going for us. If we're chosen, that edge weight's negative. The second thing we have going for us is that we're chosen by most of our parity checks. Right? That's this condition. All right? So the worst case, as for our upper bound, is that we're chosen the minimum number of times, exactly 3 fourths D, okay, and we pick up negatives, and then for the other 1 fourth D part of the time, we actually get a positive contribution. We actually have, are like 2 over D from the remaining 25%, okay? So that's the worst case, that's as big as this sum could be, yeah? So this is uh, less than uh, 3 quarters D, times minus, or sorry, most, 2 over d minus epsilon. So this is the contribution from parity checks j for whom we're the favorite variable, plus d over 4, 2 d minus epsilon. Okay, and this is the worst case where we have a full 25% of the people who didn't choose us and they actually chose a different corrupted variable, so we actually got stuck with a positive value for those parity checks. Okay. All right, so also known as minus d over 2 to d minus epsilon, which is less than minus 1. Okay. So that's case 1. Any questions about that? All right. So we just dealt with b now. 
We've dealt with B. That's true, exactly right. So we got a big check mark here, big check mark there. Unfortunately, we still have two cases because we're going to have to treat these friends of corrupted variables, vertices of K, separately from vertices of I. Okay, so intuitively, we have a control, we have control on the sum of the weights for those two different vertices for two different types of vertices for two different reasons. Can you just put the K in the same case as J? Because we said that J and K are both chosen at least three fourths these times. So let's go through let's go through the case of K. Let's see what's different. So case two. Consider a variable. So okay, so we're trying to prove A. Okay? For all the remaining vertices, vertices of I, including those in K, we're trying to prove that the sum of the weights of the incident edges is less than one. All right, so consider someone in K. So let me ask you the same question I asked you before. If all I tell you is that we have an edge IJ, and I tell you that the coordinate I belongs to K, what are the possible values that this weight might have? Okay, before it could have been any of the three. Is it still any of the three? Can't be negative. Exactly right. Okay, can't be negative. Because if you're the chosen variable, I just, uh, yeah. Mm. If you're the chosen variable and you're not corrupted, and remember if you're in K, you're not corrupted, you're just a friend of the corrupted variables. If you're the chosen variable and you're not corrupted, you're zero. Okay, so is everybody else incident to that same parity check? Okay? Mm. So that's why we can't inherit the argument for the corrupted nodes, is because we don't have any of these negative contributions. Okay? None. No negative contributions at all. Might have some zeros, might have some positive contributions. Good news is our budget is now one. Okay? But still, right, if, we got a, if we got a positive contribution, two over D, for all D of our parity checks, we'd be toast. Right? That would give us two. On the other hand, why do we have control? So what do, we want? We, what do we want? We want a lot of zero contributions and not many positive contributions. How do we have control over that? Why do we know there's many more zeros than there are positive ones? In this case, it's just by the definition of K which I guess I've erased, okay? So K are those vertices for whom uh, they share uh, lots of parity checks with corrupted variables, okay? So, oh no, that's not why, excuse me, uh, that's wrong. The reason we have control in this case is because our covering condition uh, also applies to vertices of K. That's the key point of case two, all right? So remember when we, when we had, uh, this is the key point, when we had parity checks choose their favorite variables, we insisted that not merely the corrupted variables get chosen over and over and over again, but also these friends of corrupted variables get chosen over and over and over again. And remember, if you're chosen, the worst case is that you're a zero, no matter who you are, okay? So the only way you're ever going to get a positive contribution is if somebody else was chosen and it was corrupted. Okay? So if you're chosen, you're never going to get a positive number. You'll get either negative if you're corrupted or zero if you're not corrupted. So the fact that this vertex of K is chosen over and over and over again tells us that a lot of those WIGAs must be zero. Okay? Not positive. That's the point. Okay, so in particular, so this is bounded above by what's the worst case? The worst case is that it's chosen only 75% of the time by 75% of the parity checks. And that's a zero, plus in the remaining 25%, it picks up the maximum possible contribution. Okay? And so this is just equal to D over D minus epsilon, one half, which is less than one, if I choose epsilon. If I choose epsilon sufficiently small. So that's why we're fine in case two. All right, so case three. So case three is for vertices that are not only not corrupted, but have kept a safe distance from the corrupted variables, okay? And now, this is what, I got confused, this is what I was saying for case two. So the reason we have control here, so again, for exactly the same reason, uh, the contributions to this I, they're either gonna be zero or they're gonna be positive. We want to say there aren't too many positives, there have to be enough zeros. And here we're going to use the fact that, well, by, you know, 
If you're not in K, that means most of your parity checks are totally clean. Okay? So most of your parity checks, half of your parity checks, strictly more than half of your parity checks, there doesn't even exist a corrupted variable to be chosen by that parity check. So it had to choose something uncorrupted, so you're definitely going to get a zero. Okay? That's why you get lots of zeros in this case. All right. So formally, sum of the weight contributions of all the parity checks you're part of is going to be a most. So if you looked at how I defined it, if 50% of your parity checks were not clean, then I put you in K. All right? So if you're not in K, you actually have strictly more than 50% of your parity checks uh, have no corrupted variable. So that lets me get something down and away from one half here. Again, the worst case is that you're in the fewest possible zeros, and you have the maximum possible number of ones. Every one contributes two over d minus epsilon. Uh, and this, if you choose epsilon sufficiently small, you can check that's at most one. Right, so this is like d minus 1 over 2, and that's like 2 over d, right? This could be strictly less than 1. So that closes the whole loop, right? So that says, you know, using this expansion condition, we can always exhibit these feasible weights, and by the duality argument we had at the end of last lecture, that implies uh, integrality of that linear program, which we know has to be the optimal code. Okay, so that completes the proof. Any questions about that? That's LP decoding. So. All right. Well, in that case, we're, we're finally done with this exact recovery stuff. And so we're going to move on to a different part of the course, which you already got an appetizer of when we talked about planted and semi-random graph models. So the remainder of the course is going to be devoted to analysis frameworks which draw on aspects of average case or distributional analysis and also aspects of worst case analysis. Okay? So I often call this robust distributional analysis. And there'll be many different interesting flavors of models that fall into this category. Okay, so today I just want to sort of tell you, you know, what are some of the high level features and motivations of these kinds of models and then also tell you a little bit more details about probably the most well studied such model, smooth analysis. Okay. All right, so at a high level the goal here is to try to define a way of analyzing algorithms where you get the best of both worlds, so the average case analysis world and the worst case analysis world. So what's really good about average case analysis is you often get sort of very meaningful performance guarantees and you get very sharp predictions. Uh, and what's good about the worst case world is you get very robust performance guarantees. Okay? So if you can prove anything positive, it holds in a vast array of settings. All right? So you'd like to be able to both prove something you know, very strong, but also have it apply to many settings simultaneously. Okay? So we're trying to get a sweet spot where we can have both of those at the same time. So I haven't used this notation in a while, but let me just remind you, we were talking about this early on in the course. So in general, if you have a cost measure on an algorithm, which again, this could be running time, this could be the solution quality, this could be you know, page faults, whatever. I use this notation for the cost of an algorithm, A, on an input Z. So as we discussed, worst case means you look at the you know, worst case overall input Z, maybe parameterized by the input size, something like that. So just to be clear, what I mean by average case So one thing I want to say is average case is only defined with respect to a distribution over inputs. Okay? So worst case, there's no distribution. If you like, there's no real kind of model of any inputs being more or less likely than others. Average case does not make sense unless you specify a distribution D over the input Z. And then the most standard thing you do 
is you look at the expected value on a random input drawn from the distribution D of the cost of an algorithm on a random input Z. Okay? You could certainly look at some statistic other than the expectation also, if you wanted to. Okay, but for the discussion, I'm just going to focus on the expectation. But the point is, if you have a distribution, then you can talk about average case analysis. You could imagine trying to design an algorithm that makes this as small as possible. Okay? Again, I want to emphasize that the algorithm that minimizes this quantity will in general be different for different distributions D. Okay? So again, you vary D, you vary, for example, the relative order of different algorithms okay, for the expectation. Okay. Right. So I'm not going to talk much about pure average case analysis in this class. It will show up sometimes just as sort of a benchmark against which we compare our own solutions. Uh, you know, I do want to just take a couple minutes to point out that you know, there are situations, I mean, average case analysis gets sort of a bad rap, I'd say, in the kind of theory of algorithms literature, but there's certainly situations where it's exactly what you want. And it, I even sort of think as time goes on, there's more and more situations where it's exactly what you want. So this is exactly the right analysis framework when, first of all, you have a very good understanding of the distribution over inputs for the problem you're trying to solve. And secondly, you have the luxury of really being able to design a customized algorithm for this situation. Okay? So, understanding the distribution, that generally boils down to, first of all, having reams of past data, and second of all, an assumption about low volatility. Okay? So, like, you know, the stock market, we have reams of data, but I'm not sure there's anybody who feels that confident about their understanding of the distribution over what the stock market's going to do. But there are contexts, actually lots of contexts, where you can sort of, you sort of, sort of know the distribution tomorrow is going to be like yesterday, or at least the distribution tomorrow will be like it was on a Thursday last week, something like that. Okay, and if you think about it, I mean, in the age of big data, I mean, I think there's more and more cases where this actually happens. You know, in a lot of the big companies where some of you might go on to work after graduation, you might well be tasked with you know, coming up with some optimization problem for which you have millions or billions of data points with low volatility. And in that case, by all means, you know, design the algorithm which minimizes the expected cost or some other statistic with respect to this well understood distribution. All right? In this class, we're going to be motivated more by situations where there's still some uncertainty. So maybe you believe there really is a distribution and you're just not so sure about what it is, just because maybe your data isn't very rich or maybe just it's changing so fast. Uh, you, you're just not confident about um, optimizing overly with respect to a distribution D. Or it may be that we're more interested in understanding the performance of a general purpose algorithm, like say the simplex method for, program for linear programming, rather than coming up with some new algorithm specifically tailored to some distribution. Okay, those are both sort of kind of domains we're thinking about. So there's good things about average case analysis. The main issues are, I'd say, uncertainty about D. So maybe D exists and you don't know it. And there's also an issue with overfitting. Which is even if you know D today and then you, and then you optimize, you, know, you get every last cent out of your algorithm with respect to today's distribution, it could be you lose some robustness. It could be that if things are different next week, because you've tailored your algorithm so carefully to how things are today, it doesn't respond very well to how things are next week. Okay. So those are two reasons why you might want to add some robustness to just the high-level idea of minimizing this expectation. Okay, so how would one do that? So most of the remaining models I'm going to talk about can be cast as a hybrid model, again I mean hybrid between worst and average case analysis here, of the following form. So let's see be a set of distributions over inputs. So I realize this is a little abstract at the moment. Uh, I'll talk about how to interpret the set C in a second. So there's some, so the way to think about it is, you believe there really is a distribution over inputs. You're not sure what it is. You suspect it lies somewhere in this set C, but maybe C includes a bunch of Gaussians, a bunch of uniform distributions, various parameters for those distributions, et cetera, okay? 
And you'd rather not have to, you know, you don't understand enough about the application to commit to something as specific as like a parametric form for the distribution over inputs. But you like an algorithm that would work well, kind of no matter what reality is. Okay, so you believe reality is well described by distribution, you're not sure which. Can you have something which simultaneously works well across all of these possible realities? So, rather than taking a worst case over inputs, we're going to take a worst case over distributions. So I'm going to hedge my bet over which of these distributions actually governs the data. And then for a given <coughs> distribution over inputs, I want the expected cost, or again, some other statistic if you prefer, to be as small as possible. Okay? So a number of the things we're going to do next can be interpreted as instantiations of this idea. For the moment, I want you to think about this set C of distributions as exporting a knob that you can turn to interpolate between the average case world and the worst case world. If the set C is a singleton, right, so if the set C has just one distribution in it, then the max is vacuous, and so it just reduces to average case analysis. Okay, so one thing in C is average case analysis. If C is super big, so if in particular it includes every possible point mass on a given input, then for the point masses, this disappears. And this just becomes some fixed input. And you're taking the max over all possible inputs. And then you recover the worst case model. Okay? So the sort of you know, the smaller C is, and you know, the more randomness there is in the various points of C, the closer you are to average case analysis, the richer C is, and the more deterministic these distributions can be, the closer you are to worst case analysis. And we're looking for a sweet spot in between the two. All right? This is genius. Okay. So, why would you do this? Or why do people do this? So like with a lot of the other high-level ideas we've talked about, there's a number of motivations, and they don't all apply in all situations. Okay, for each of these motivations, it sometimes applies. So the first thing which, which sort of it works really well for, in all of the applications, is you avoid pathological inputs. And in particular, in smooth analysis, this is really kind of the number one reason uh, people study it. So we, you know, we talked at length about the perils of worst case analysis, especially, for example, in online paging. And we talked about how, you know, basically you get overly pessimistic performance predictions and you get meaningless or even incorrect, in some sense, comparisons between different algorithms because the performance is governed by these potentially very unrealistic pathological inputs. So having a distribution allows you to avoid those. Okay, as long as no, I mean, if the pathological inputs are sort of very sparse, and you have any kind of diffuse distribution, they're not going to play an important role in your algorithm design or analysis. Okay? So a reason which you may or may not, which may or may not be the goal, is to model quote unquote real data. Okay? But that's still uncertain. Okay? So maybe you have in mind that you know, data is somehow sufficiently random, and we'll have an application in hashing in a few lectures where this is very explicit, and you don't want to actually commit to you know, some very precise definition of what's being inserted into your hash table, but you at least know that there's sufficient randomness in the data. Okay? You believe that about real world data. Okay? So it's sort of a nice way to you know, articulate qualitative properties that real data has without getting too specific. Okay. So sort of a consequence of this, of this uh, first point is there's plenty of situations where there are algorithms for which neither worst case analysis nor average case analysis advocates for them strongly, yet empirically they seem to be really good general purpose solutions. And so this analysis framework seems to capture some of the reasons why that's true. It's not good in the worst case, you know, it's not you know, the literal best algorithm for any one distribution, but it almost always works really well. And again, simplex method for linear programming being a canonical example. And the fourth one, which we won't see that mu we won't see very much, we won't see much of it for a couple lectures or for a couple weeks, 
But just like with parameterizations, when we first started talking about parameterizations, the goal was merely to analyze existing algorithms, like the LRU algorithm for paging. But then at some point, once we had some novel parameterizations, we just couldn't resist trying to design some new algorithms that did even better with respect to these parameters. So like maximum weight independent sets, we had this you know, very cool algorithm where you know, the variant of the greedy algorithm where you pick sort of you know, more nodes than before and then compute a, a maximum weight independent set in the bipartite graph. And the, that we were driven to that with a novel parameterization. So in the same way, whenever you have an, a new way to analyze algorithms, it, you know, it's natural to ask, does it naturally guide you to new algorithmic ideas that seem useful? But the next several lectures, this really won't be the point. Really, for the next several lectures, just like with parameterized analysis, I want to start with applications where it's used only in the analysis. Then we'll talk a little bit about how it might guide design. Okay. Good. All right. So that's kind of very high level. Let me try to help make this a little more concrete for you. So first of all, let me point out that we've already seen something which is a, you know, can sort of be thought of as a special case of this. It's sort of a, a slightly degenerate version because of the symmetry involved. But you can sort of think of planet graph models in this way, okay? Think, for example, about planet clique, okay? Where somebody picks k nodes to planet clique, and then you fill in the rest of the edges with probably 50% each. That's like having one distribution D for each choice of where you put that initial K clique. Okay? Once you decide on the K clique, now you just have this distribution over graphs. And there, in effect, our cost measure was just zero or one, depending on if the algorithm was correct or incorrect. And we just wanted to be correct with probability close to one, no matter where the clique was planted. That is, for every single distribution D in that class. Okay? So that's one example. But really, a full-blown example is smooth analysis. Okay. And really, of all the alternatives to worst-case analysis that have been proposed, this one, I think, is the most well-known and most extensively studied. That says there's still a lot of stuff we don't know about it. But uh, more work on this probably than any of the other models uh, we're, we're talking about uh, in this class. And uh, I'll talk about this probably for the next three lectures or so different applications of it. So how does it work? Well, that's a nice idea. It's one of these hybrid models. So an adversary picks an input. Okay? So if you like a linear program. Okay? Possibly a linear program on which the simplex method runs in exponential time. Okay? So pick some worst case input. But then nature slightly perturbs the input. So perturbation can be, is going to mean different things in different cases. You could think of it as like adding a very small Gaussian or you know, some other kind of random variable that's not too big relative to the magnitude of the values in the input. Okay? All right. And you know, so there's a couple of nice things. So really the main motivation for smooth analysis is this first point. Okay? So for algorithms that just like simplex, which have this very sparse set of very bad inputs, it's going to allow us to get rid of them, in effect. But it also has a nice interpretation as far as modeling real data. Whenever you have a computational problem where the data is being supplied by some kind of measurement, then it's natural to think of as, you know, what you really see is some measured value of ground truth. Okay, so it's some noisy version. You know, maybe the noise is even very small, but, you know, if nothing else, there were like, you know, rounding errors in the floating point arithmetic, and, you know, it's not clear that, you know, you see the uh, exact ground truth. You see some slightly noisy version of it. And so this says that, you know, if ever you have input, you know, that uh, has this small noise in it, that actually is already enough to justify the fast performance of certain algorithms. Okay, so let me also just compare it briefly to semi-random models. So semi-random models don't quite fit in here because the order is some sense reversed. So in a semi-random model, nature goes first. It picks like a planet clique instance. And then an adversary gets to go second. And if it wants, it can, for example, remove edges that aren't part of the clique. Okay, so that's like a reversal of these order. All right? So they're both totally reasonable, nice models, but they're just, they're not, I don't know how to unify those two because of the difference in orders. Okay, so. What is the goal in smooth analysis? 
Um, I guess let me first say, you know, when, when should you, for what kinds of problems should you consider using smooth analysis? Okay. So when does it work? When useful? Um, so the main thing is that the bad inputs, right, so whatever cost model you're using, whatever computational problem you're thinking about, the bad, and whatever algorithm you're thinking about, the bad inputs for that algorithm should be very fragile. Okay? In the sense that, you know, they really seem very delicate. They're usually extremely hard to construct. The clay minty cube example, the bad example for simplex, took decades after the invention of the simplex method. And you just look at it, I'm not gonna go actually prove it in class, but if you go read about the clay minty cube, you look at it, you're like, that's a real knife edge example. Right? It's just kind of obvious, right? And all of the killer apps with smooth analysis really are for problems where it's just clear that the, the pathological examples are these knife edge examples, okay? So for that exact same reason, Usually, it's about running time analysis. So again, remember, this is an abstract cost measure. Okay, in our different applications, this has meant many, many different things. Sometimes it means running time. For smooth analysis, it's pretty much always going to mean running time. Okay? So usually for runtime analysis. And the reason is that for other cost measures, the bad examples actually aren't that fragile. Okay, and you can't really get rid of them with perturbations. You know, like if you think about the greedy algorithm for maximum weight independent set or something like that, right? You know, if you perturb the vertex weights by epsilon, it's really not going to fundamentally change the performance of that algorithm, that heuristic. Okay, so if there's a bad input for the original one, a slightly perturbed version is going to be an almost bad input for the same algorithm. Okay? So it just turns out that you, tend, you seem to only have this fragility of inputs for, you know, specific cost measures. All right, so in some sense, you know, this, you know, smooth analysis isn't always the right, you know, isn't always an interesting framework to apply, but for the types of problems that are in its crosshairs, it does really well. Okay. All right. So the goal then, so now just think about runtime. The question is when can you have algorithms, when can you prove that an algorithm has polynomial smoothed complexity? So this is going to be the supremum, right? So the adversary picks the input first. So we take a, a max or a soup over input z. And then we take an expectation over perturbations, which I'm going to note by r of sigma for now. Sigma here is the size of the perturbation. So you could think of this if it's a Gaussian. You think of this as the standard deviation of the Gaussian. OK, so if sigma is small, you're adding a small perturbation. If sigma is big, you're adding a big perturbation, a lot of noise. And then in here, you're looking at the cost, which we're going to think about running time of A on Z plus the perturbation. So you want to prove that this quantity is polynomial in the input size N and in 1 over sigma. Okay? So again, again, with smooth analysis, usually we'll have one exception, but usually it's more like you, you, you know, you're more having the perspective of we know this algorithm works well, let's explain why. Okay, so the algorithm is fixed, and you're just trying to understand its performance. Okay, so we have an algorithm A like simplex, and you know, we know simplex is exponential time in the worst case, which means we know that as the perturbation approaches, just being deterministically zero, this running time has to blow up. Okay? So we know we need some dependence on the size of the perturbation sigma, because if sigma is zero, it is exponential time. Okay? So it has to be polynomial in n in some function of sigma. And it turns out the right thing to try to be polynomial in is one over sigma. Okay? All right. And so you know, I hope it's clear. I wrote these next to each other for a reason. You know, clearly this is you know, an instance of a hybrid model. So here, for each you know, worst case input, so for each choice of z, you have a separate distribution d. The corresponding distribution is just the slightly fuzzy version of inputs around the center point z. Okay? So again, that's your class. Class is like slightly fuzzed out point masses. And you want to do as well as possible on every single one. Okay? All right, good. All 
All right. So I want to conclude the lecture with a discussion of sort of the, the origin story and still kind of the main, the biggest killer app uh, of smooth analysis, which is to the simplex method. And so really, smooth analysis was invented for this purpose. So this is by Spielman and Tang in 01. And I'm just going to talk about what they did at a high level. Okay, so what is their result? Um, so basically, so what do they prove? Okay, so they prove simplex, despite having worst case uh, exponential running time, in this sense it does have polynomial smooth complexity. Okay. So they were thinking about linear programs. So think like, you know, minimize C transpose X subject to AX equal B, something like this. So again, what, so the formal theorem statement says, consider an arbitrary linear program. So you get to pick C, A, and B arbitrarily. For some of the, most of the applications we'll talk about are not that sensitive to the perturbation distribution. This actually does seem, or at least no one knows how to prove it without a very specific perturbation distribution. The good news is the, pertur the perturbation distribution is Gaussians, which is sort of the best justified distribution if you're only going to use one. So their perturbation model, so their notion of R of sigma, they, really, they, just add a they just add IID Gaussians to every single entry of the constraint matrix A, to every single entry of the right-hand side B, with standard deviation sigma. And they prove that a particular variant of the simplex method, which I'll explain in a second, indeed in this sense has running time polynomial and n and 1 over sigma. It's a really big polynomial. So in that sense, it's not a super accurate description of the empirical performance, which is usually thought to be roughly linear in n. It's a much, much bigger polynomial than linear. But it is polynomial, okay? which is nice. OK, so any questions about kind of the statement? Is that a question? Yeah, so I, I don't know whether, does this hold for like uniform distribution with like max bound? Like I, does there, I mean that seems like the other construction that might like possibly right. work sort of black box. Most of the theorems that we'll talk about, yes. I do not, I, as far as I know there is not a proof. For this one. Yeah, I, I think everyone believes that's true. Okay. It's just sort of the analytical bear, I mean um, yeah, yeah, yeah. hurdles are very high. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so already the original proof of this was, you know, dozens and dozens of pages uh, for Gaussians. Okay, and, and so that, so needless to say, we're not going to be covering it in lecture in any detail. But I wanted to say a little bit about it, you know, because, you know, it is kind of the calling card for smooth analysis. All right, so, um, so let me tell you a little bit about it. So first recall what the simplex method is, geometrically, right? So geometrically, you know, I've drawn this cartoon a number of times already. Right, but so linear programs, you're maximizing a linear function over an intersection of half spaces. So in two space, it's just a polygon. And again, remember, a linear function is just like a direction. Right, so you're trying to find that vertex if you're trying to maximize that direction. Okay? Now, the simplex method uh, geometrically is very intuitive. Okay? You just walk along edges of the feasible region. Okay? So even in higher dimensions, it's called a polytope. Okay? But you still have these edges. Okay, so you, you, you just walk corner to corner along an edge, all right? And you always walk along some direction where the objective function gets better, okay? So it's almost like a local search algorithm, except by linearity, it turns out all the local maxima are also global maxima, okay? So you just keep getting better and better and better, and then eventually you stop when no edge makes you even better than where you are now, okay? And you're optimal. So correctness isn't really an issue with simplex. It's more, you know, how fast does it happen? And, you know, just so to be clear, you know, you look in two dimensions and you get a little bit fooled, right? Because you're like, how hard could this be to just like, you know, in the worst case, I walk around this polygon, you know, big deal, right? And in two dimensions, you know, if you have like M half spaces, you're going to have like M sides, right, to this polygon. So big deal, right? But now think about like going to higher dimensions, okay? So, and just think about something really simple. Think about just like a hypercube in N dimensions, right? Now all of a sudden there's two to the n vertices, okay? 
So if you literally you know, visited every single vertex of your polytope, you'd be in trouble. Okay? Then the running time really would be exponential in n. And actually the clay minty example is sort of a tweaked version of a hypercube. Right? So they actually show that there's basically two of the n vertices and simplex actually can visit every single vertex. Okay? So not only the number, of the number of vertices can grow exponentially in the dimensions, but in fact in pathological examples, simplex visits them all. all right? Okay, so, but anyways, geometrically that's what simplex is doing. But like with any kind of local search style algorithm, this algorithm is kind of underdefined, right? Because when you're at one of these vertices and you have these like 100 different edges, maybe, you know, 73 of them are going to make you worse. So clearly you're not going to take any of those. But then there are these 27, all of which would lead to an improvement in your objective function. Okay? Now, again, in 2D, you don't get an appreciation for this, right? It's kind of like there aren't that many ways you can go. But in high dimensions, there can be lots of different directions you can go. And you have to decide if there's 27 improving edges, which one do you follow? So the choice of which edge to follow out of many improving ones is known in this context as a pivot rule. So you have different flavors of the simplex method depending on how you instantiate the pivot rule. Okay? So the result of Spielman and Tang is for one particular choice of the pivot rule. Okay, and as far as I know, there is no smooth complexity result known for any other choice of the pivot rule. Not because people think it's false, just again, it has resisted attempts of analysis. This is sort of hard enough. Okay? So let me tell you a little bit about the pivot rule. The pivot rule is called the shadow pivot rule. Which I have to say, if you had a, for practical, from a practical perspective, if you only had an analysis of one pivot rule, you probably wouldn't choose this one. Um, but it's cool, it's cool enough. Um, so here's, here's what you do. So we observe that like simplex is pretty easy in two dimensions, right? So the idea is just to project your high dimensional polytope down into two dimensions. All right, so you have this high dimensional, like an N space. And imagine you sort of like hang a light source from above it. And then you look at the shadow that it casts on the ground. Okay, so that's a picture that looks something like that. Okay, which I'll pass around. So when you hang this light bulb behind the polytope and you look at its shadow, some of the vertices will still show up in the shadow, but some will disappear. Some will get swallowed up into the interior. Okay, so there's no new corners in the shadow. Every corner in the shadow is a corner in the original polytope, but you know, you will lose some of the corners of the original polytope. Okay? So the idea then is like, okay, well why not just project it down into the plane and then run simplex in the plane? Right? Because simplex in the plane, right? You know, we, we talked about it. If you only have M half spaces, you're going to have M edges, so you're just going to zip through there in linear time. Okay? Well, the problem is this doesn't quite work. Okay? The reason this doesn't quite work is, you know, uh, it's true that if the, if the constraints are originally specified in the plane, you're only going to have one side, okay, per constraint. But if you have just a small number of constraints in high dimensions, like the hypercube, and then you hang the light bulb behind it from the wrong an angle, you'll actually see an exponential number of corners down in the plane. Okay, so basically you'll still have most of the exponentially many corners in high dimensional space, you'll still have that in the projection. Okay? So just because you reduced it to two dimensions doesn't mean you suddenly get a free lunch and can just zip around. I mean, it will be linear time and the number of facets down in the plane, but that could be exponentially large. Okay? So technically then, here's, uh, here's sort of the, the, the hard theorem that Spielman and Tang prove. They prove that the expected number of vertices, or equivalently in two dimensions, number of, number of sides of the shadow is polynomial in n and 1 over sigma. Okay? And so, actually the way they prove this, and the way a lot of these smooth analyses work, actually is sort of a nice instantiation of something I told you a long time ago. We were talking about parameterizing algorithms. Uh, one of the many reasons I gave you of why you might want to parameterize the running time of an algorithm is it sort of suggests an approach to explaining good empirical performance, right? So first you say, oh, well, you know, for certain values of this parameter, this algorithm runs fast. And now real world data, in some sense, has, easy, you know, has nice values for this parameter. Okay, and this works exactly in this way. So if you're in two dimensions, 
and you have, uh, you have a polygon, and you're just trying to figure out how many facets there are. Suppose I told you something about the angles between two consecutive sides, okay? So that angle is going to be less than pi, okay? And as you traverse this polygon, okay, in total, it's going to be like a two pi rotation, okay? So if I told you that each one of these angles was bounded away from pi, so it was a less than pi, but it was even like at most pi minus delta, then after two pi over delta turns, you'd have made the full circle, okay? So this minimum angle between, you know, between one of these consecutive sides and pi can serve as a sort of condition number, and it's straightforward to analyze the number of iterations in terms of that gap, okay? So what they actually prove is they say consider the biggest delta such that all angles of the shadow are at most pi minus delta, okay? then what they actually show is that the expected value of pi is now bounded below by something that's at least inverse polynomial in n and 1 over sigma. Okay? So the number of turns you'll take walking around the polytope is most 2 pi over this, so that's the most polynomial in n and 1 over sigma. Okay? So that's sort of the gist. And we'll see this same template reoccur in, you know, for other applications which are you know, both pretty cool but also that I can actually teach you fully in lecture, where it'll have the same spirit. We'll say, okay, the running time of say local search is bounded by a polynomial on these various parameters, and as long as there's a small perturbation, these parameters themselves are polynomially bounded, and that'll give us the final result. Okay, so we'll start that in earnest on Monday. See you then. <laughs>